Good morning or good afternoon or evening as the case may be. This presentation is going to look at funding sources for rangeland projects and we're going to look at it from two perspectives. First of all from the global donor organization perspective and secondly addressing issues of financial support for projects within the United States. And I'm supported, uh, my name is Ben Norton, I'm supported by two colleagues, Robert Washington Allen and Bill Payne at the University of Nevada. Now let's begin with the global perspective, looking at funding agencies that support rangeland activities and projects. And these agencies can be divided into two groups. There is first of all an old guard, the established agencies, many of them banks, that have adopted climate change as part of their current portfolios. They adopted it over the last decade or so. Um, and then secondly, agencies that from their beginning were specifically designed to support environmental issues. And many of these began with a focus on climate change. In this list of 12 of the old guard, they're listed in the order in which they were established and I've also provided their current headquarters location. Climate change was not their original concern, but they are worth looking at in terms of potential funding for rangeland projects. And I've highlighted three of them, the World Bank, FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization, and UNEP, the United Nations Environment Program. Uh, the two asterisk uh, entries here, USAID, the Agency for, Agency for International Development, and DBSA, the Development Bank of Southern Africa, are not really international in, in the sense that they are entirely supported by their host governments, the United States in the case of USAID and the Republic of South Africa in the case of DBSA. Now a list of eight agencies that were designed to address environmental issues. The International Union for the Conservation of Nature is the oldest of these, established in 1948, uh, followed by UNEP, IPCC, the International Interagency Panel on Climate Change. Doesn't really fund projects, but they pay, play a very important role in organizing the COP conferences, the Conference of the Parties, like the COP26 in Glasgow last year. And this interagency panel provides reports on the status of climate change issues and makes recommendations. GEF, the Global Environment Facility, and the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification, along with the Green Climate Fund, I've highlighted because they're going to receive more attention in a moment. As I mentioned, the, they're international with two exceptions, USAID and the Development Bank of Southern Africa, which serves the Southern African Development Community, SADC, a group of half a dozen countries in Southern Africa. The principal donors for the big agencies are the United States, European countries, Canada, Japan, and Australia. Now I've selected from those two lists eight agencies that I think you should focus on. And on this particular group, the first group, are three from that initial list of the old guard. FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization, EFAD, the International Fund for Agricultural Development, and the World Bank, especially the unit within the World Bank called the International Development Association, which helps the poorest countries, those with a gross national income per capita of less than $4,000. And here is on the second group of, of organizations I think you should pay attention to, uh, UNEP, IUCN, and the Convention on Combating Desertification. And some of the uh, comments, characteris characteristics of these three agencies I've described on the right-hand side of this. Finally, two that I 
think warrant even more attention, more special attention. The Global Environment Facility, which is the first global source of funds for climate change and adaptation uh, since it was established in 1992 at the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro. And the Green Climate Fund, the youngest one on the block, established in 2010, but didn't, really didn't get active in 2000, until 2014 or 15. And currently, it's the world's largest climate fund investing in climate resistant so how does this funding process actually work? Well, member countries donate millions of dollars to specific agencies and banks. And I've listed a few of these, for example. Some of these entities serve as financial mechanisms to distribute and monitor funds. The World Bank is maybe the main one. And other agencies, their principal role is to implement projects, approve them, provide the money and monitor the progress of those projects. And GEF and GCF are major entities in this particular category. The members that supply millions of dollars to these agencies and banks uh, come from the vast global community and they vary. In the case of the World Bank, there's 189 members that contribute uh, in the case of the Asian Development Bank, 68 members. The Bank of Latin America has 17 in its membership role. West African Development Bank has eight members. Um, Asian, sorry, the African Development Bank has 81 members and so on. So all these members have financial obligations to contribute. And in many cases, um, if your country is not a member of that uh, uh, particular agency or bank, then you can't receive funding from that agency or bank. So that's another thing to pay attention to. Is your country a member of a particular agency or bank that might provide funds? Access to these funding agencies is initiated by the home national government and the, those government departments. And they then work with an international agency to assist with project design. And remember, the projects are initiated by governments and they work with UN agencies and international banks. But there are two facilitation avenues. One is that national governments often have a representative within a UN agency who serves as the point of contact between the UN and that country. And if your country happens to be a member, a country member of one of those agencies or banks, then see if you've got a representative within the organization. Secondly, many UN agencies, and I think of the FAO in particular, they have an in-country office with a in-country representative that facilitates liaison between that agency and the home country. What can you do as an individual member of the International Year of Rangelands and Pastoralists to become involved in a project, a rangeland project of some kind? And there are basically two ways you can do this. One is to pay attention to any government announcement of your home government that outlines a potential project that they've already started preparing for and inviting interested parties to submit a proposal. Many, many cases, the ideas for these projects comes from the international agency of which your country is a member. And secondly, get to know individuals in your government or make strategic contacts with personnel working for an international agency. And that avenue is probably the best. What can you do as a researcher? Well, not many government global agency funded projects have a research component, but questions arise that can only be addressed by research methods. And these are questions that call for gathering information or supporting assumptions. In a rangeland setting, for example, carbon sequestration is greatly enhanced by promoting growth of perennial grasses. So you may need to be in a project that requires measurement 
and monitoring of plant production in order to show whether the project has been successful. So finally, I want to emphasize two very important UN agencies in terms of climate change and project opportunities. The Global Environment Facility, since 2001, has spent $15 billion on 40, 440 projects in 130 countries. The Green Climate Fund, much younger, in its website it lists currently 190 projects approved, many of them serving multiple countries. And I had a personal experience in preparing a proposal for submission to the Green Climate Fund and that was in Kyrgyzstan, where I volunteered as a rangeland specialist for an FAO proposal development team. And I was the only rangeland specialist on the team and contributed substantially to the proposal. Um, we focused on some degraded area in Kyrgyzstan and the project that was approved with a budget of $50 million was implemented by FAO and a national forestry agency. And the, what is interesting is when you go to the website and click on this project, it tells you that in Kyrgyzstan, livestock is the most important source of income, primary source of nutrition and financial safety net for the rural poor. And that the issue that the project was addressing was degradation of resources due to overgrazing and climate change. So rangeland rehabilitation was a critical component of the proposal, even though it didn't really feature prominently in the title of the project. My contribution was to recommend better grazing management, such as rotational grazing with long rest periods. So for the second component of this presentation, we'll look at the American domestic funding scene. And this is material that's been gathered together by Robert Washington Allen and Bill Payne. And it's focused on remote sensing research activities, which is their expertise. But it will give you a scope, uh, a sense of the, of the possibilities uh, within the United States for funding of range activities. We'll start with the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, which funded a project looking at ecological risk assessment. Um, the Department of Energy project on remote sensing and GIS technologies to determine ecological risks. The National Science Foundation looking at fire as a driver in cheatgrass invaded sagebrush. Um, the Bureau of Education and Cultural Affairs in the United States government funded a project in Mozambique on environmental assessment and that was funded through the University of Virginia. Uh, the Forest Service and the USDA looked at the ecological footprint of livestock herbivory on rangeland productivity and another project assessing grazing strategies to reduce fine fuels in Nevada rangelands. A project in Colombia on water quality and sustainability and another in Southern Africa through the University of Virginia on uh, structure and function of Southern African water resources. And the Department of Defense again and USDA Cooperative Research and Extension Services, several projects, including one using GPS collars on livestock, on cattle, uh, as agricultural tools for managing extensive rangeland production systems. And uh, in Bolivia, funded by the US Agency for International Development, a remote sensing study of land use and land cover change on the Bolivian Altiplano. Internally, um, the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, um, the sixth project here on reconstruction of dry land carbon dynamics using remote sensing and tree ring analysis, also known as dendrochronology. And finally, we have two slides looking at sources, um, lists of research opportunities. Um, the research notes in IFOED, SPIN, the world's largest database of funding opportunities, and another database called PIVOT, uh, national, international, and local sponsors are listed. 
And finally, at grants.gov, you can look at grant opportunities from American government agencies and the Foundation Center with its website listed there, its link. Um, you can find information on, a, on foundations such as the Skoll Foundation, Rockefeller Foundation, the Ford Foundation, and so on. And finally, to whet your appetite, when you go as a VIP with some translators and staff to one of the poorest villages in Tajikistan, you'll be presented with this kind of a spread for lunch. It's hard to resist and wonderful to enjoy. And on that note, thank you very much for your attention.